If you were to ask me what is the worst type of combat situation you could find yourself in in the Star Wars galaxy, I would say it's probably any type of situation when you're fighting inside of a ship. In case you haven't seen the recent Ahsoka series, it starts off with a very Rogue One, Darth Vader inspired hallway massacre. Instead of the Alderanian consular security with their goofy helmets, you have the New Republic ship security with those goofy helmets. Instead of the Sith Lord Darth Vader, you have the Dark Jedi Balin Skull. His force powers are a bit weaker, his moves are a bit less terrifying, but one still can't help but feel terrible for these poor blue boys and the predicament that they're in. In today's video, we're going to be talking about why on ship combat occurs and why people still carry out these operations despite them being very chaotic and dangerous and costly. We're going to talk about the you know fundamental problems that you face as defenders and as the attackers in these situations. And finally, we're going to talk about some solutions that might help you be more successful. So in the Star Wars Galaxy, ship combat kind of mirrors naval battles here on Earth. This isn't the expanse where ships have to pull off orbital maneuvers and fire missiles and countermeasures from hundreds of thousands of miles away and use computer algorithm powered point defense weapons. Yes, that's really cool and it's super nerdy and I think there is an audience for that. I really like the expanse. But sometimes we want to see bodies vented out into space and beautiful flowery looking explosions. And let's be honest guys, as controversial as the sequels were, and as annoying as Admiral Holdo might be, hyperspace ramming gets the blood flowing. I think it's pretty hard to say that it wasn't epic, even if it does break the fundamental rules of ship combat in Star Wars. But the point is, you know, this is how things happen. So these things happen for the same reason why starfighters still engage in line of sight dogfights using energy conservation and management as if they were flying in atmosphere, rather than firing guided missiles from 100 miles away. Star Wars is all about entertainment. It's supposed to be fun, and this is why there are essentially still naval boarding engagements in this universe. And one of the major reasons is, like during the Age of Sail, there was more parity between offensive and defensive weapons. Yes, gunpowder weapons were incredibly terrifying and effective in their own way, but you know, during the Age of Sail, you didn't have um, you know very effective high explosive or armor piercing munitions. He did have armor piercing munitions, but they just weren't as good as the things we have today. And so it took more than one cannon round to blow up a ship. It would take many. And perhaps more importantly, the accuracy and fire rate of these weapons were just not all that high. Also, acceptance of casualties back then were probably higher in those days as well. It wasn't uncommon for European powers to press men into service on board their naval ships. And so oftentimes these ships could get within pretty close range of one another, and sometimes one side will send a boarding party to the other side. And this was a real legitimate way to prevent further damage being done to your own ship. And it was also a way to secure a victory. Or better yet, you could capture an enemy vessel and prevent all of those valuables from sinking to the ocean floor. Now, thanks to deflector shields and upgraded armor paneling, in Star Wars, ships can take on broadside exchanges as well. Although these types of broadside engagements only occur during very crowded battles in orbit, like what occurred during Coruscant, this was not an ideal situation for either side. But as we mentioned before, high casualties were tolerated because the clones were not technically citizens of the Republic and didn't have the same independence advocacy or rights as regular human beings. And the droids, well, they were property, basically. More often, space navy battles in Star Wars occurred at line of sight ranges or within the same planetary system. Sometimes naval boardings were carried out in order to silence the enemy's capabilities. Like when the Republic Navy took on the Malevolence and couldn't actually destroy the massive ship with external weapons and had to destroy it from within with a small Jedi boarding team. Then you have cases like the Confederacy of Independent Systems Munificent Class Star Frigate. Although they were completely outgunned by the Venator Class Star Destroyer, mainly used by the Republic, these ships did have an ace up their sleeve. You see, most CIS ships were formerly freighters, and so the Munificent could actually carry up to 150,000 droids, including the B-2 Super Battle Droid, which could be equipped with the jetpack. During the Battle of Quell, an outgun force of five Munificent Class Starfighters was able to rout four Venator Class Star Destroyers by using a huge boarding party of Super Battle Droids to create havoc on board of that Republic ship. In other cases, the mission might be to retrieve something from a vessel alive or intact, like when Asajj Ventress intercepted the Tranquility and tried to extract new Gunray from the prison on board. He was being taken to Coruscant for trial by the Republic Senate commandos. Then there was the case where the Mandalorian and all those thugs infiltrated that New Republic prison to spring out that knife-toothed murderer chin. So as you can see, there are a wide assortment of reasons why naval boarding engagements are carried out. I'm pretty sure I've missed many. Thank you. 
So what are the fundamental challenges of this type of military operation? Well, you're basically facing all of the challenges you normally would in a CQC situation, but with the added danger of being on spaceships, and so any heavy weapons or explosives are naturally a huge risk to use. Everyone loses when the hole is breached, except for maybe Chopper. So first, let's talk about the challenges that attackers have to face. The most difficult part of any boarding operation is the boarding itself. Typically, you can breach a starship in a few ways. You can force airlocks open, fly ships into an enemy hangar through their openings. The Separatists even had their own type of assault ship known as a Trident, which could drill right through the hull of an enemy ship and deposit troops on board. Hondo and Naka's pirates used a grappling system with an umbilical tube to take over the Crucible, which puts the boarder's ship in less danger. The problem with using airlocks is during contested landings, these doors have to be breached and in a careful way so that they don't actually do structural damage to either ship. Usually this involves not using explosives, but cutting tools, which gives the enemy forces time to set up a defense. Airlock doors tend to be very small, no wider than two people standing side by side, which of course creates a natural death funnel and causes heavy casualties. And that could really stall an entire operation. Hangars allow you to deploy a lot more troops onto a ship. You can even fly your dropship directly into another ship as long as there is an opening. However, the enemy could also prepare a hangar for defensive purposes, and you might be walking into a giant kill zone. Or maybe the security team will just decide to vent you into space. Breaching the hole yourself in unexpected areas gives you more of an element of surprise, but you have to have specialized ships and tools to create a perfect seal so that there is an explosive decompression. Once aboard an enemy ship, it pays to have schematics, or at least the floor plans of how things work. You're gonna be fighting a crew that will most likely know every inch of this vessel. Heck, they might even call this hunk of metal their home. If you guys want a good military novel set in the Star Wars galaxy, I recommend you guys check out Twilight Company. It follows the 61st Mobile Infantry uh, during its exploits in the Galactic Civil War. And during one of their missions, they actually try to take out a light Imperial transport uh, for some parts they need to use to repair their hyperdrive. And let me tell you, every intersection, every doorway was a place where they suffered casualties. It was an incredibly difficult operation. And this is really due to the nature of a ship's design. There's just such limited space inside of ships. And unless you're the Confederacy of Invent Systems, you're gonna need to pressurize that entire vessel. Large open areas are a luxury that you'll only really see on the largest civilian liners. Most of the time, your space marines are just gonna be dealing with narrow hallways of death, lined up on both sides with small compartments. And every now and then, an intersection will lead to another hallway of death. Sometimes there's only enough room for one or two people, and uh, honestly, you really can't do anything about that if you want to take the ship in one piece. All the enemy really needs in this situation is one E-Web with a you know metal shield on it, and you get a meat grinder. Every doorway can be booby-trapped, every bunk bed could have someone hiding beneath it. It's a freaking nightmare. On top of that, most ships have a security system, both active ones and passive sensors or cameras that allow defenders to know exactly where you are and what you're doing. It takes a great deal of training and nerves of steel to carry out an operation like this, and even if things go well, casualties are to be expected, no matter what. It's just the nature of this operation, and it's something that I think most military leaders will try to avoid. Now, for defenders, you're gonna be facing some of the same problems as the enemy. In CQC situations, there's usually parity when it comes to casualties between attackers and defenders. Yes, you can ambush enemies, but unless you have some perfectly concealed ambush point where you can safely withdraw to another point, the second you open fire, they're gonna know where you are and you're probably gonna be very close to them. So death awaits. The distances are too close everywhere on the ship and the same hallways that you follow your enemies into are where you're gonna have to retreat to. The same compartments you surprise enemy forces from are where you're gonna probably make your last stand. And oftentimes starships are just designed to repel boarding actions, but not built to allow defenders to easily defend once attackers are inside. I mean, normally when you're in defense, you have prepared positions that are layered. You fight the enemy once they get close, you withdraw, fight them again, withdraw, fight them again, and withdraw. The idea is to not let them get so close where casualties become kind of equal. That's kind of impossible in a CQC situation on board of a ship. Also, keep in mind while this is happening, most likely the border ship is not being assaulted, which means the crew are intact and they're probably actively undermining your ship's ability to defend itself by taking out weapons and placements or attacking the engine, making running away impossible. As the fight spills to other compartments on board your ship, maybe the engineering room gets taken out. Maybe your bridge gets taken out. It's just not a good situation.
So there's really no good way to tackle this kind of situation, but we'll try to, you know, outline some things you can do in different phases. I think preparing the enemy ship properly before boarding is the best way to limit casualties. Of course, if you have the element to surprise on your side, then by all means, go for it. But generally, such infiltrations are taken on by lone ships with a small squad of troopers. But to actually take over another ship and hold it, well, that requires a much larger contingent of marines. Ideally, at least three to five times the size of whatever the defenders have. And if you have to land that many individuals on an enemy ship, most likely they're gonna see you coming. So the idea here is to prepare the ship as much as possible for your troops to encounter less resistance. Just like naval engagements during the Age of Sail, the idea was always to destroy your enemy's fighting capabilities before you board. You can use chain shots to take down the mass, grape shots to take down the crew, and solid rounds to create breaches and damage enemy firing positions. The same idea applies to these type of space naval encounters, except for the fact that hull breaches also offer a new way to enter an enemy ship. You're also depopulating entire compartments full of crew who probably aren't in vac suits when you create a hull breach. If you can hit a command center or the bridge and knock out the bridge officer, suddenly your enemy vessel won't be able to organize itself nearly as effectively. Hitting a ship's engine slows it down, making the boarding operation a lot easier. Or better yet, if you can use ion munitions and disable the ship's power plants, point defense systems, life support, security systems, heck, maybe even the blast doors, that'd be great. Because the idea here is to make it very hard for defenders to coordinate a defense. Although it should be noted that most ships do have backup generators. Now, in some situations, you're just not gonna be able to prepare your target in this way, simply because it's gonna be too well defended. Like in the case of the Malevolence, which was just too well defended. Ideally, what you can do is either use stealth or maybe spread your troops uh, apart so that you can attack different parts of the ship, making it much more confusing and difficult for the enemy to respond. You know, during Operation Overlord in World War II, the ship that enabled the Allies to take the heavily guarded shores in Normandy was not the larger landing ship tank or these battleships with their massive 14-inch guns. Interesting fact, by the way, the USS Texas flooded its starboard torpedo blister, giving the vessel a two-degree list so that the gun could fire further inland. Anyway, the ship that really helped the Allies take the five beaches at Normandy was the wooden Higgins boat. Light, cheap, quick enough to deploy a platoon of men on shore and then return to a bigger ship for more personnel. If the Allies had used bigger ships than this, it would have been very easy for the Germans to basically target a big concentration of troops, which of course is terrible. The Allies knew that they were gonna take hits regardless, so by dispersing their manpower, they made it much harder for German artillery and gunners to strike landing forces properly. The same applies for a boarding operation. The idea is to spread out your troops, um, hit the enemy where they don't think you're gonna hit them, and also try to avoid point defense weapons. If the ship is just bristling with them, well then concentrate your forces into one small area and try to overwhelm the local defenders. Use smaller ships like the Drach class boarding ship. Use LAATs that can allow you to land. Heck, Anna can even use an ATTE walker once to land supporting fire on an enemy separate vessel. Absolutely nuts and genius. Concerning the ATTE had magnetic clamps for feet and was pressurized. Another good option is personal jetpacks as the Mandalorians used them when they attacked the Imperial Indictor at Atalan. This tactic was also used by clone troopers during the orbital battle over Coruscant. When Twilight Company attacked the Imperial transport we talked about earlier, they refitted escape pods with grappling hooks and laser cutters to make some ad hoc boarding vessels. And more importantly, they created more avenues of approach for their troopers. So they weren't just bottled up in one area. Now, what you bring into combat is really the difference between life and death sometimes. Obviously, bringing weapons that work in confined spaces is ideal. The DC-15 carbine is a much better choice than something like the full DC-15 battle rifle we see being used during Geonosis. Consider your armor choice and what helmet you decide to wear as well, if you decide to wear one. Armor can provide a lot of protection, which is important for your point man. But it also can be bulky and limit your movements. It can be really heavy and fatigue you. Helmets can also limit peripheral vision. But I have to say, a lot of these helmets have targeting computers inside of them, which allow you to basically see in a heads up display where your gun is pointing. This can be really useful for firing um, from the hip or maybe off bore or around corners. And while not everyone has a force user on their side who can block weapons in a dangerous hallway where cover is limited, a laser shield like the ones used during the Battle of Ringo Vinda can go a long way to keep your point man on his feet. When entering a CQC situation, communication and training are key. That training is all about speed, aggression, and not allowing your defenders to react in time. In this high stress, tight environment, your mental clarity is key. Any type of hesitation because of fear of death or something like that 
can cause a lot of casualties. Untrained personnel have the tendency, for instance, to hesitate before entering rooms and intersections because of the perceived danger there. But in order to actively control a room, it's all about getting as many of your friendlies inside a room as possible. And that means please don't stop in the doorway. Movement in a CQC environment has to be extremely precise. You kind of have to think about every move like it's a chess game. You know, every move exposes you to new danger, but also removes you from older danger. In general, you do need a lot of training and drilling to get comfortable with these concepts. If you don't have personnel who are trained in this type of boarding operation, you can expect really, really high casualties. The stormtroopers, for instance, as dumb as they were, were perfectly suited for this type of mission. They never hesitated in combat and they relentlessly moved forward towards their enemy, making them quite difficult to fight in areas where you can't withdraw. Ideally, you also bring in uh, non-lethal stuff like stun grenades, which can help clear areas before you enter them. Um, also, being, uh, bringing a slicer who can hack into the security system so you can use that security system against your defenders is a really good idea. Also, bringing breaching tools that allow you to make your own entrances into you know, compartments and different hallways is a big help. It can allow you to circumvent enemy prepared defensive positions inside. The most important targets that needs to be captured and secured are the bridge, the engineering room, and comms room. If you can control these areas, there's a good chance that your boarding party will be successful at grabbing a new vessel. So there you have it, guys. That is one of the worst combat situations you can be in. And there's, here's some advice about how you can get your way around it, or at least survive. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.